This episode is sponsored by This Naked Mind Institute, our coach certification program, where we certify the next generation of coaches to help people find freedom and experience transformational and life-giving shifts that come from science-based and compassion-led learning. These coaches are empowered with world-class trainings, industry-leading tools and resources, and the most recent scientific studies to help others learn how to create real, rich, raw, and authentic lives free from alcohol. So if you're at the point in your own personal journey where you really want to help others and pay it forward to give what you've been given and help others find freedom, joy, and ultimate happiness, then I invite you to apply for the next class of This Naked Mind Institute and join our incredibly coaching community at thisnakedmindinstitute.com. Well, hello, hello, everybody. Coach Scott here. I am back with another edition of Coaching Questions, and I am joined by another incredible coach. I have Coach Rena Bowring with me today. Rena, how are you? I'm great, Scott. Thank you. So Rena specializes, and she works with all types of people, but she she focuses on moms of young kids in the Christian community. Rena, I would love to hear a little bit more about that and kind of how you arrived at it and just, I don't know, it's interesting. Yeah, well, um, you know, I I was yeah quite a heavy drinker from a very young age. Um, I'd say it's, I started drinking at about the age of 13, um, but it never really felt like a problem until after I had kids that's mm-hmm. when it's it kind of changed because I was so overwhelmed you know I was trying to do all things and be all things and um have it all like uh like you know everybody makes us believe that we can have and that just caused so much overwhelm and that's when I started to drink to to kind of cope with that feeling yeah. and so um Luckily, I found this naked mind and was able to stop drinking when my kids were still young. But I'm so passionate about other moms who are going through that and are drinking because of, you know, that belief and and trying to juggle it all because I because I resonate with that so much. And um, as a Christian, particularly in the Christian community, because I was looking for somebody or something in the church to help me and I just couldn't find anything and that was you know I think that just delayed me so so long from getting um moving forward and so I think it's so important to have these conversations in churches and to kind of break the the theory that like we're you know or the guys that we're we're kind of perfect and we need to be perfect and and you know because underneath nobody's perfect so really just kind of I mean, except me, come on, let's be honest. (laughs) (laughs) No, I actually, I really love this. Um, I really love this. And I have actually had, um, we've had a lot of different people kind of approach us uh, asking about this specifically because, um, you know, in a lot of churches, at least here in the States, I mean, clearly from your accent, you're in Germany, obviously. No, you're in Australia. (laughs) Um, And uh, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but here in the States, it was like, it's very AA heavy. And so um, people will go and, and, you know, as we talk about in our programs, AA isn't necessarily for everybody. Um, But as, uh, as, people would reach out to us. They would say, look, I really want to get help. I really want to get support. um, And I really want to do it in my community, in my church community, but the only thing that's available is AA. And that just hasn't been for me. So I love this idea because honestly, like where else is like, this is a community that's all about like, you know, um, helping each other. And like, that's a big part of what a congregation does. And so I love this idea. I totally love it. Yeah, it's so awesome. And you're, that's so true. The only thing that was there was AA. And it was like, I did not feel that I, I was bad enough. I was too high functioning. You know, I didn't mm-hmm. feel that I would belong there or fit in there. And yeah. I never resonated with the whole powerless idea. Um, it just didn't feel right for me. And yeah. I still think people gain so much from, you know, coming to this naked mind and hearing like, I, I'm not powerless. I'm empowered. Absolutely. And, you know, and that whole approach, approach of grace and compassion, I think that it is actually living out so, so many of the values that um, the Christian community has, but they just don't know how to access that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know? 
Well, you know, it's interesting too, because a lot of people, a lot of people also approach us and say, I, there's, there's no spirituality in the, this naked mind approach. Is that true? Um, and it is true, right? Like we are, we stick to like the science and the facts and like, that's how this process works. And in a lot of ways, that's in a, in a reaction to um, a lot of other methods that have that component that I know can turn people off. Um, but what I love about the method and I love about what we're doing with you guys, with our coaches, is that you can take that method and then you can use it you know, in a faith setting, right? Like where you can actually have these conversations. And this is, I mean, of course, I am not going to touch like the faith conversation with a 10 foot pole in this, you know, in this podcast. However, um, it's important to people, right? For some people, it's important. It's an important part of their life. And so I love the fact that you can take this like sort of secular approach and put it in that community so that the people who want to have those conversations can be part of it, right? And it doesn't feel, I don't know, it doesn't feel forced at all. It's just very sort of open and, and natural. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I love how, you know, the science actually proves like how grace and compassion is good for you, good for your right. health, how it actually moves you towards change. And it's like, science is actually proving you know what you believe already and it kind of feeds off each other and strengthens each other and it's like it's we're not against science anymore it's like yeah we are working with science and it's, yes. it's so powerful that's awesome it. so yeah. i have uh, i have some questions here you want to answer a few yeah i love it all right question number one is this one of the things that holds me back is the idea that I won't be the full me without alcohol. I have felt at various times like I am a funnier, more engaging, more interesting, and better at conversation after a drink. Part of me knows this isn't true, but somewhere I feel like I still believe this. How can I get past it? Yeah. Oh, I love this question because I think that everybody can resonate with at least some of that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I used to believe that I was like funnier, more outgoing, um, you know, just a, a, nice, a better person to be around when I was drinking. And it's so interesting because we, most of us start drinking quite young and mm. alcohol makes us kind of numb the inhibitions of, of not feeling the discomfort of being in those situations around other yes. people, right? Yeah. So it kind of tricks our brain into thinking that we are more confident, but really we're just not seeing the cues that are coming from, you know, the other people or from ourselves, more importantly, Absolutely. about the situations that we're in. I mean, we might be telling a joke and nobody's laughing, but we're not registering that anymore. That. <laughs> <laughs> That's still happening, isn't it, Scott? <laughs> Um, so I would say to that, you know, within there, I just hear probably three or four different beliefs yeah. that you can really just one at a time look at and ask, is this really true? You know, yeah. is this really true that I'm that I'm more fun with, that al with alcohol? And is there any experience that I have that that's not true? And what mm -hmm. about what other people say? You know, can I go to my closest friends and the people around me and ask them do you like me for me more or am I actually a better person to be around yeah. when I've had a couple yeah. of dreams <laughs> I love that I love that and I think like you're pointing to something really important and and by the way like for those of you who are listening to this and might be feeling the same way whether it's this belief or others and this idea that's like consciously I know this isn't true but like part of me feels like it's true First of all, that's cognitive dissonance, right? That that kind of sucks. So that sort of anxiety that you might be feeling is totally normal around this stuff. Um, and yeah, Rena, like I think interrogating these beliefs and really like, you know, using something like the liminal process that we talk about um, in the path is, is really important. But I actually have found, and this doesn't work all the time, but very often what can happen in these situations, especially if we're intellectually convinced, is just to do an experiment. And I don't mean the alcohol experiment, right? What I mean is, all right, I really feel like I'm funnier and more engaging when I drink. 
I'm going to go out four times in the next week or whatever, right? I'm going to go to these events where I'd normally drink and not drink. And let's see what happens. Let's see how I feel. Let's see how other people react to me. Um, that sometimes that like real world experience can kind of just break those beliefs for us. So like, that's something that I've seen be very powerful too. Have you worked with anyone who's done that? Yeah. And I love that, Scott, that you bring that up because on that, you know, I think it's so important to give yourself not just one experience, but like maybe two or three, I would say three at a minimum, because, you know, the first time you do anything alcohol free, you are so aware of now you've got the feelings of anxiety and, you know, it's it's new. So you haven't put yourself in that, in that situation yet. So the first time can be quite challenging Yes. But then the next time gets so much easier. And then the next time gets so much easier. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'd actually, uh, you know, with my clients, like I suggest doing it, like giving it at least three shots yes. before you make your, <laughs> you know, your, your analysis on it. Um, and just going into it with that, with that, okay, I know it's going to feel a little bit awkward or mm -hmm. um, a little bit different, but um, just overlaying that with that curiosity of like, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to drop all expectations and all judgments and see like, what is it that yes. I actually enjoy? Totally. What is it that I don't enjoy? You know, totally. And I, I think like one of the things that is really important and people sometimes when I say this are like, what are you talking about? Like, this is crazy, but like to really make this a true experiment and to really take the pressure off you know, if you say, all right, I'm going to try it three times, it's important to tell yourself, if this isn't true, then I'm going to allow myself to drink again after those three times, right? Like I am going to do this. And this is a little bit counterintuitive, but what this essentially does is it takes that voice in your brain. That's like, you're never going to be the same, right? This is going to, your socialization is going to suck for the rest of your life. And it just turns down the volume on that because you know, all right, I've committed to three outings and then I'll make a decision and like it is incredible how much freedom there is in that right a lot of people see it as restriction and like oh I'm not taking no 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 we're we're messing around right we're like doing an experiment we're like seeing what's going to happen um I feel like that's so incredibly powerful amazing it, it takes that pressure off doesn't it it's like I'm literally just doing an experiment. There's no pressure here. If I if I find out out that that I was totally wrong, then I just go back to drinking. No pressure. Yeah. 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 I it's very that is very counter. I have a lot of people raise eyebrows when I say that. And and that by the way, it's like as you know, Rena, like that's that's how the method works. Like if you were to join the alcohol experiment, um, that's a 30 day break from alcohol. And we actually will not tell you at the end or anywhere in the middle, like, don't drink ever again. The whole purpose is to do an experiment to like treat our lives like a science experiment, which by the way, is really fun. Like it's really yeah. interesting to do. <laughs> so true. I use the experiment concept with, you know, anything mm -hmm. that I, that I have to do that is different from what, what I'm used to. Yes. I'm just like, I just, I'm just going to do an experiment. You know, I, I do it with my kids. I do it with like, if my kids are, you know, ha having some like odd behaviors, I'm like, I'm just going to experiment with like, just accepting it and see if, it, if, what does that do, you know, instead yes. of trying to like discipline or control it. And it's like, huh, you know, <laughs> it really takes the pressure off because it's not like forever. It's just, I'm just doing a little experiment and seeing what happens. Yeah, right. Very powerful. Right. Awesome. All right, let's go on to question number two. Here we go. Leaving my office at the end of the day is a huge trigger for me. Those two, and then in parentheses, or six beers that I would have when I got home were almost like a transition from work me to home me. It feels like quitting drinking is going to take this transition away. What can I do? Yeah. Oh, what a good question. Isn't that so true? And I can so resonate with this because that's exactly what I used to do. I used yeah. to like be on full steam the whole day. Mm -hmm. And then I knew it was coming to five or six o'clock and I needed that kind of switch just to go from full on work mode to evening mode. And the thing is that like, 
you know, when we use that switch with alcohol, it, it really does work like that. It, you, you can yeah. literally like a light switch. You can go from 100 miles per hour to completely, um, you know, relaxed or numb, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But then you have all of these negative consequences after the top, after the fact. Yes. And so, I, you know, I think the best thing that has kind of helped me when I was moving towards uh, healthier ways of winding down was really to, first of all, just make a list of like 10, 15 things, alternate things that I could do that actually helped me to get my mind off work that bookmarked so to say the end of the day so things that you could only do if you know you weren't in a fight or flight situation like a lion wasn't chasing you like literally <laughs> you know sometimes it's like 10 or 15 minutes of building a puzzle or coloring with my kids when I get home or something that is just really uh, the opposite of a very hectic busy day yeah. Um, and I find that just having that that intentional bookmark at the end of the day can really help to set you up for a much calmer evening. I think that is so key. And I think, first of all, I love that this person kind of recognizes like, wait a minute, there is a transition from work me to home me. Right. So there's like a period of time and, you know, we're humans. We like rituals, right? We like have like marking the end of one thing and the beginning of something else. And um, it is amazing uh, for so many of us, like how that really was alcohol. Like it was absolutely the case for me. Like I used to be like, I would drive home from work and like get home. I'm still thinking about work, still like engaged with it. And I pour that first scotch. And that first sip for me was like, all right, now I'm home. Um, and I think so often to your point, like finding replacements for these things is really important. So I love that the person who wrote in is recognizing this because that means it's a trigger, right? That means it's something that they can work with. Um, so just the fact that they see this, I think off the bat is amazing. Um, but now comes the work of finding that thing, right? What is that thing that you are going to do for a lot of us? And I'm not sure this person said leaving my office at the end of the day. Um, this is the post COVID world, or I guess still maybe kind of in COVID. So that might mean leaving their basement or actually driving, yeah. um, whatever it is that transit time I have found, I work outside of my house. Um, and so I have about a 15, maybe 20 minute drive home. That time for me is golden. And I have found that like, that can be where I switch from, you know, work Scott to home Scott. Not that there's actually a lot of difference for me, but I have a weird job, but like, I, um, you know, I'm very intentional about the music or the podcasts that I listen to. Um, and I really try to be aware of like, all right, how do I want to show up? Like when I come in that front door, how do I want to be? You know, um, there are days where I'm kind of, you know, maybe whatever, I'm like listening to politics or something on the way home. And maybe I'm not always the nicest guy when I get home, but if I'm listening to music, right, I'm coming in the door, I'm high-fiving everyone, like, it's amazing. So finding those replacements is massive, massive, and just a way to sort of disengage. Um, another thing that I found, um, which, uh, depending on what type of phone, you, I think it's different with different types of phones, um, I actually have like a work mode for my home, uh, my phone and a personal mode. Um, so I go in, when I walk in the door, it, I change it to personal, at least for a few hours, because that's going to, I mute all of my work notifications um, just for a couple of hours. And that is also really helpful in that, like, mm -hmm. it's really tough to keep getting dragged you know, dragged back in. Um, so what are some other, I'm interested in like, what are some other tactics that you've seen people use to kind of mark oh. this trend or any sort of a transition? Yeah, well, this one's huge because I think, you know, anybody who drinks, you know, uses alcohol in some way in this way. And yeah. so it's so huge, but I think one of the huge, biggest gifts of, of, you know, getting some space away from alcohol is that, once you have a little bit of space away from alcohol, you can start to notice 
much earlier when you are feeling very stressed or anxious or overwhelmed or you know you are just having a bad day and so one thing that has been really life-changing for me is kind of really tapping into that you know because we get really used to ignoring those sensations and often we we, we don't even notice it until it is you know bubbling up to the surface and we're having you know kind of a a moment and so just simply uh intentionally kind of checking in with yourself multiple times or more frequently during the day and literally just being like whenever you have a little pause or you're just standing in, in a line or you're in the car driving, you just take a moment to check in with yourself and you ask yourself, like, how am I feeling right now? You know, on a scale yes. from zero being terrible to 10 being amazing, where would I put my emotional well being right now? And if you start to see that dip through the day, so maybe you started on a seven and then you got a really bad call and then your boss yelled at you. And so every time you do this, you notice. The kind of stress scale ticking up and maybe you're going down on the emotional scale so really when you're dipping below 50 percent much like your phone battery i love mm. that you put that night mode though you you just you, you almost start to sink really quickly right yes and yeah. so when you check in with yourself more frequently you can actually catch that sooner and that is a mm. signal to say you know, again, have a list of things that you can do that like you, like, you know, your, your favorite playlist or just taking a walk or taking a break or reprioritizing your day. Like you don't have to do your whole list today. What can I move or delegate or, or do to make some space to look after myself? Yeah. And as you do this, you know, you recharge, you get home and you're not actually at a two when you go get home every day. You actually find yourself like maybe I'm at a six or a seven most days when I get home now. And so I don't need that that switch to switch off because I'm actually feeling much better because I'm listening to what I need more often. I love that. That is amazing. That is so yeah. good. All right, last, well, not last question, second to last question. Um, here we go. There is so much to do every day. I feel like my to-do list is longer and longer and the only break I'm using air quotes for those of you listening. The only break I get from it is with wine. I feel like I'm just going to keep working and working and working on things around the house if I don't have this reason to stop my nightly glass or three of wine. Um, Is there a better way to tame my inner overachiever? (laughs) (laughs) I love this because, you know, I love a good to-do list and getting through it is like a little dopamine hit. Every time you mark something off, you're like, yes, I did it. Yes, I did it. You know, but the thing is like alcohol is such an overstimulation that you don't actually feel the achievement of doing those things so much when you, when you're drinking, right. It takes away from that. Yeah. So, you know, another great thing about taking a break from alcohol is that you'll notice that those things that you're doing, you're actually getting more joy from them. You're actually feeling a little bit of a reward of just doing the thing itself, you know? Mm -hmm. And so whatever you're doing and ticking off during the day is, you know, becoming more satisfying and more joyful. And again, you don't feel like you need alcohol. And I think that there is such, you know, and as somebody who like, loves to work with moms who feel overwhelmed and want to overachieve and want talk to about to-do lists yeah, <laughs> yeah like I mean a great to-do list um but the thing is that we have learned that we need to have a drink in our hand to give ourselves permission to sit down for five minutes yes yes you know it's it's like we don't actually need a drink in our hand to give ourselves permission to do that you can give yourself permission to go sit on the couch and do nothing and rest because you deserve it because you're worth it (laughs) and you really don't need a drink in your hand to to do that and simply I think again you know this this person is aware of it which is amazing um totally noticing yeah just just you know carving out some time if you're a to-do list person, you know, scheduling that in and putting that on your to-do list, rest time, 
whether totally. that is. Yeah. Well, I think this is something that I've found. We deal with this at my house. Um, spoiler alert, I'm not the overachiever, but my wife is, she calls it puttering, right? And so like in the evenings, you know, the kids are in bed. Sometimes it's hard for her to like stop. And for me, I'm always like, all right, I will get to that tomorrow, right? And it's just sort of like different perspectives. Um, but one, th one thing that we found to be very helpful for both of us um, is to have a like a bound list. So like, yes, our to-do lists get longer and longer, but you can put a demarcation line in there <laughs> and you can say, all right, yes, I acknowledge. I acknowledge that my list is getting longer, but I'm going to stop here for tonight. You know, I think that that like, that idea and like it's kind of similar to your idea of like oh put put rest and relaxation on that to-do list like that is really really important and I think another thing that that I hear a lot about with this is this idea of like well actually what this person just wrote in my to-do list is getting longer and longer it's like the focus is on that end what about the stuff you're checking off every day like are you high-fiving yourself are you like celebrating that and I think it's so easy for us to just focus on the next thing to get done and lose sight of what we've actually achieved. Um, one of the things that can make this, and this is old school, uh, but one of the things that can make this uh, really helpful is to actually have a list, um, like a physical list, maybe even on paper and actually cross things off right? Because like, I know on our phones, like there's a to-do app on there. I use it all the time, but the, it disappears. And so what happens is like the psychological effect of that is you don't have any sense of like, oh, wait a minute, I've achieved. It's always, I have to do. Um, yeah. Like that can be incredibly powerful. Um, and one last thing that I just, I've suggested before that I think can be really, really helpful is like really plan something for yourself at the end of the day that's going to make you feel good. And this is similar to what you were saying, Rena, but like make it special, especially until you get used to it. Right. So like, yeah, maybe you want to go take a hot bath. Maybe you want to go for a long walk. Maybe you want to watch a movie. Maybe you want to eat ice cream. Right. It's, it's really about this idea of like, oh, I'm going to celebrate what I've achieved. And this is the goal at the end of the day. And the fact is, you know, we train our brains, right, with drinking and using drinking as a reason to stop and all of that stuff. Um, that's just conditioning. And the good news is that conditioning can be unconditioned. I don't know if that's the right word, but like we can change that, right? We can condition ourselves to be looking forward to, you know, that time reading a good book at the end of the day instead of that time with alcohol. Yeah. Yeah, I love that so much. And the other thing that I think is really helpful is within your huge to-do list, you know, I like to pick, because I used to want to get through the whole list as well. And it used to yeah. be like an obsession, you know, if I get through the whole list, I've had a productive day and then Boy, I can celebrate it. And then that, that is hard. <laughs> it's so hard. And the list always kept growing and I never got through it. So I never yep. celebrated it, like you were saying. But um, something that's really worked well for me is, is picking two or three things on that list that is an absolute like priority for you that, that you'll really feel is going to move you forward towards your goals for that for that day if you get the two or three things done and everything else on the list becomes like you know more flexible like if I have time if I'm not tired yes if other things don't interrupt because I get I used to get really overwhelmed with interruptions or changes in my schedule mm -hmm. because I didn't have that flexibility in there so doing that means that like, you know, two or three things feels really achievable and you kind of celebrate that. And, and no matter what else happens, even if the kids are sick, I can get two or three things done, you know? Yes. So, and then my day becomes just so much more flexible and often, most often I'll get so much more done than that. But it's that, it's that flexibility and that the mindset of like, I am moving forward. I did get my two or three things yes. done and my day is open, you know, to to interruptions, changes, or whatever, you know, I, I feel like doing the rest of the day. Awesome. 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 All right. It is time for the dreaded curveball question. I, I took it easy <laughs> on you, so don't worry. <laughs> oh, um, so Rena, if you could turn into any animal in the world, which animal would you choose to turn into? Oh, it's a great question. I'd have to be my dog. <laughs> the uh -huh. most. Explain yourself, please. 
Well, just super cute. Sits at the front gate and gets attention from everybody walking past the whole day. So gets attention pretty much the whole day, you know, whether we're around or not. And is just, you know, the most spoiled, uh, loving, happy little animal in the world. So we definitely not mind having that life. I love that. What a great <laughs> answer. What a great, and it was fast too. Um, so coach Rena Bowring, thank you for joining me today. Um, where can people go to find out more about you? What's your website? Yeah. So, um, my business is alcohol freedom and people can find me at www.alcoholfreedom.com.au. Awesome. Well, thank you. And to those of you listening, thank you so much for tuning in. We will be back again soon with another episode of Coaching Questions. And until then, see you soon. Take care. Are you realizing that there's something more? That you're so excited about this change in your life. Maybe you've put down the bottle for good and you just want to pay it forward. You want to help others in their moments of need move through that discomfort. You wonder what it feels like to celebrate with your own journey by paying it forward and giving back what you've been given. Now is the time to find out. Enrollment is now open for our coaching certification program with this Naked Mind Institute. In just six months, you can receive the training, the resources, and tools you need to become our next certified coach so that you can start your entrepreneurial journey or grow your already existing business while helping thousands of others to find freedom, joy, and happiness. If you're hearing that little voice calling that says you're meant for so much more in this journey, then I invite you to leave your comfort zone behind and learn more about becoming a certified coach at thisnakedmindinstitute.com. And as always, rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast as it truly helps the message reach somebody who might need to hear it today.